This morning's first scripture reading is from the book of Acts, the 11th chapter, verses 19 through 26. And if you're using a red church Bible, that can be found on page 1068. Again, Acts 11, verses 19 through 26. Now, those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed, traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word only among the Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. May the Lord add his blessing. This morning, the second scripture reading, staying in the book of Acts, from the fourth chapter of Acts. We'll be reading verses 5 through 12, and that's on page 1058 in the Red Church Bible. The fourth chapter of Acts, verses 5 through 12, on page 1058. The next day, the rulers, the elders, and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there, and so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and others of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people. If we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the, the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Let's, uh, let's give it this time to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Uh, gracious Heavenly Father, um, may you give grace to what you have laid upon my heart, and may you give me the freedom uh, to speak and to share what is upon my heart. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So folks, I was led to uh, speak this morning on the name that's above every name because we're talking about possibly changing the name of our church. And speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ, Luke writes in Acts chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, and which Dave just read. I want to reread them for emphasis. Uh, he, that is Jesus Christ, is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, which became the chief cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven 
that has been given among men by which we must be saved. There is no other name under heaven. There is no other name in heaven. There is no other name under heaven. There is no other name in all the universe whereby a person must be saved. Uh, there was an, a Washington Post article in 2012 entitled, What's in a Name? Now, that question comes out of a line from Shakespeare, where a Romeo and, uh, Juliet, uh, Romeo and Juliet Shakespeare version. And so Shakespeare has Juliet say, What's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. In other words, call it a rose or call it something else, it really doesn't matter because it's a rose, it's a flower, and it's going to smell sweet. And the author goes on to say, quote, Shakespeare didn't think that names should matter very much, but many of us would disagree with old Shakespeare on how much a name matters. So I ask you the question, what's in a name? It's a very, very relevant question especially given the fact that we're on the verge of considering changing the name of the church. I've said this before, I'm going to say it again. Words matter. Amen? The Holy Spirit, using human authors, wrote the scriptures very specifically, using specific words and grammar and thought to communicate God's heart and God's mind. Words do matter. And yet we live in a time where everything's being uprooted and twisted and redefined. Oh, that's really wicked. What am I talking about? I'm talking about maybe your new iPhone? You know, the new boots you got? The new car you're driving? You know, growing up, it was groovy. And it was cool. I don't even know what they're doing today. I can't even keep up with it. But you know, you not only have two genders now, right? Uh, you have how many cis how many genders, cisgenders? Give me a break. Right? I, I think I mentioned like in a sermon about two years ago, a year and a half, two years ago, there were 72 like genders at the time, or cisgenders, or whatever. Now there's like 97. Give me a break. Names matter. Amen? And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name. What is, what's the name we're talking about? Jesus Christ. There is no other name under heaven that has been given among the men by which we must be saved. I've got a tie on here this morning. The Alpha and the Omega. Messiah, the Truth, the Good Shepherd, Savior, the Word, Lamb of... I mean, go on and on and on. Words matter and names matter, folks. And God directed, if you go to Scripture, God directed... The naming of Jesus, did he not? Say, Jesus means Savior, Deliverer, the Lord's salvation. You go to Matthew chapter 1. The angel appears to Gabriel and says, You shall name, uh, appears to Joseph. The angel appears to Joseph and says, You shall name his, call his name Jesus, for it is he who will save his people from their sins. God directed that from heaven's throne. Again, verse 23, they shall call his name Emmanuel, translated God with us. Uh, Jesus said of himself in John 8, chapter, uh, chapter 8, verse 24, unless you believe that I am he, the Messiah, you shall die in your sins. Matthew 28, verse 18, Jesus also said of himself, quote, all authority is given to me in heaven and in earth. Not some, not a little bit, not great, all authority in heaven and in earth. He's the name that's above all names. Because his name is Jesus. Because he overcame the grave. Because he could save people from their sins. Because he's eternally God the Son. The Apostle Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. He said... 
For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What's in a name? Names mean everything. Jesus is the name that's above every name. You read the Gospels, the demons recognize him, and they trembled and they shuddered. In Acts chapter 4, verse 10, uh, notice that it was by the name of Jesus Christ that they preached and healed and shared the Gospel. And it was also by the name of Jesus Christ that they were told to shut up. They were, they were arrested for preaching the name of Jesus. You mentioned the name Christ today in the media. You're mocked and you're scored. You mentioned the name Mohammed, they give you a pass. Right? So they do. In Acts chapter 11, uh, the other passage that Dave read this morning, verse 20, the scripture says they were preaching the Lord Jesus. They didn't preach about being a Baptist. And they didn't preach about being a Catholic. And they didn't preach about being a Methodist or a Presbyterian or an Episcopalian or an Anglican or any other denominational label. As I read my Bible, they preached the Lord Jesus. They preached about becoming a follower, a disciple of Christ. How have we gotten here? All these denominational labels are man-made representations. They're not even biblical representations. You tell me where they were called Baptists or Methodists or Presbyterians in the Scriptures or Anglicans or Episcopalians. Show it to me, please. They're, they're church history representations because the church got away about simply making it about Jesus. You know, we have a we have a unique way as human beings of complicating things, don't we? Seriously and sincerely. In fact, if you take a look at the scripture in Acts 11, um, it was the disciples that were first called Christians in Antioch. Not Baptists. Not Presbyterians, not Lutherans, Christians. Wow. That's radical, isn't it? As I read my Bible again, I see none of these church history denominational names ever apply to believers. Only 1,500 years later, with the Protestant Reformation, did you start to see these names pop up? Because for 1,500 years, the institutionalized church lost sight of preaching Jesus. There were believers, but they lost sight, generally speaking, of preaching Christ. And they got into all sorts of man-made religion and works. And so Martin Luther led it back to the Bible movement. And there was an explosion of biblical truth. And so next thing you know, People that are baptizing by immersion were called Baptists. And people who rejected the top-down leadership of the Pope and the Anglican Church, uh, you know, um, in England, they were called Congregationalists. And then those who wanted to separate themselves were called Puritans. And on and on and on and on. Got away from the Gospel. Got away from Christian got away from simply Jesus. I have a denominational, I have a, a handbook on denominations. I bought it probably, I don't know, 20, 25 years ago. And uh, it's on my shelf in the office. At the time, there were over 12,000 denominations. I looked it up on my phone. 
Anyone want to take a stab at how many groups, branches, or denominations we have today? <laughs> this is about 25 years later. Come on, somebody. I mean, the book says over 12,000. Give me a number. 50,000. Uh, not you're, you're shooting high for the start. That's good. Uh, but let's uh, like over 30. Somebody else? Over 30,000. We keep dividing. That's what we do. You know, a lot of people don't know this, but Zwingli was a Swiss reformer. Luther was a German reformer. They both met because they were reformers. They agreed on 14 and 15 points. You know what they disagreed on? Communion. So they separated. Oh, we can't, we can't hang out together. Can't do that. Unbelievable. And they were great men of God. Great men of God. I bet you, I'm not a betting man. I'm not a Baptist, but I'm not a betting man. Well, sometimes, maybe. I like to bet my kids to make sure that I'm right, they're wrong. <laughs> I'll bet you that all of you, or most of you, couldn't even tell me what the difference is between Baptist, Presbyterian, Methodist, Lutheran, Episcopalian, Anglican, or Catholic. Okay. Or Baptist. Did I mention Baptist? Let alone the statement of Baptist is. The core focus of the early church was Jesus Christ. They preached Christ. They were persecuted for Christ. They held to the testimony of Jesus, Revelation 1. To them it was about Jesus, and to us it should be about Jesus. It's a, he's a name, it's above all names. And as I read my Bible, uh, the name Christian is the biblical name that trumps all the denominational labels. I can relate to being a Christian. I can't relate to being a Baptist. You know, after I accepted the Lord and God laid it upon my heart to go to Bible school and seminary, and you know, you know what people said to me? Oh, you became a Baptist. No, I became a Bible-believing Christian. <laughs> well, you're a Baptist. You pastor a Baptist church, right? No, I'm a pastor who happens to pastor a Baptist church. It's insane. You know what I tell, used to tell people? I kiddingly told people I'm more Catholic than I am Baptist because I was raised Catholic. I can relate to being Catholic. I was raised Catholic. I wasn't raised Baptist. It's, it's insane. My wife can relate to being Baptist. She was raised Baptist. Although I think there was a time where they did go to a Methodist church. J.B. Phillips, an Anglican, Minister, actually, uh, Anglican, Anglicans, I'll tell you, are the, the English branch of the Episcopalian Church. Actually, the Episcopalians are actually the American version of the Anglican Church. That would be the right way to express it. Anglicans, Episcopalians, Anglicans are British, Episcopalians are American, but they're kind of the same, right? He wrote a book called Your God is Too Small, and he encouraged believers to re redefine their understanding of Christ and Christianity without labels and earthly constraints. He suggested that you not throw out the words, but he also suggested you don't put God in the box and that God is only found in a Baptist church or another Protestant denomination of the church, or any other label. I would submit to you, when you hear a denominational label today, be mindful. If you think you know what that means, be mindful that everything's being uprooted. It's not what it used to mean. It's not the same. It doesn't necessarily stand for Bible or Scripture anymore or Christian. I've tried to communicate that to the church family. I'm on the front lines of it, folks. I know what I'm talking about. 
<laughs> it's the old age, uh, the old, the old adage, right, Harold? Buyer beware. Buyer beware. You ever buy something? He's like, what a piece of junk. That's not what they advertise, right? Everything's being uprooted. Denominations are fracturing over scripture. They're fracturing over the gay issue. They're fracturing over the trans issue. They're fracturing over everything. That's probably why we have about 30,000 denominations today instead of 12, based on 25 years ago. <clears throat> I don't know how long I've preaching, been preaching, but um, you know, I, I said to somebody, oh, it's going to be a short message. Maybe 10, 12, 15 minutes max. I don't know, maybe it is. I leave you with a one final thought in the form of a question. And it's a rhetorical question. Was this church founded on becoming a Baptist or being a Baptist? Or was it founded on preaching Christ? I hope and I think and I pray this is the latter. Preach of Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, may we search the scriptures like the Bereans, and may our hearts uh, be found to be true uh, to the scriptures and uh, ultimately to you. A, a very, very tall order. Um, we again pray that your Holy Spirit would prevail in all that is said and done in our business meeting and in this church uh, beyond the business meeting. Um, may you bless uh, our hearts and the fellowship with the saints. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.